Time to turn to our insiders for their take on the hot political topics of the day. Pick and choose which one. There's plenty of them. Joining us tonight, Republican consultant Alfredo Rodriguez and Jessica Holmes, the Democrat and chairwoman of the Wake County Commission. Good to see you both. Welcome back to the program. And you had an address today, didn't you, Jess? Yeah, the, we had the state of the city and the state of the county. So I was honored to share an update on the state of the county alongside Mayor Nancy McFarland sharing an update on the state of our city. I'm assuming the state of the county is good. The state of Wake County is very good. All right. Alfredo, the state of Charlotte, uh, divisive tonight <laughs> after that uh, vote yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is the fallout from this in Charlotte, particularly for Democrats? Well, you know, I think there's an obvious thing going on here, uh, particularly with some of the younger Democrats on the council. Um, and I'm glad to name them Braxton and Dimple. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be fairly blunt. Uh, you know, I don't think they, they care much about their duties and responsibilities on the council. Um, I don't think they care too much about uh, the city of Charlotte. Uh, I think they see this as an opportunity to um, launch to a higher office when that opportunity presents itself. Uh, and so I think that's why you see them often, uh, all too often, uh, being vociferous about, um, you know, uh, you know, policies that clearly hurt the city of Charlotte. Um, you know, it's a no-brainer. Bringing the RNC uh, convention to Charlotte is going to be a, a boon for the local economy and local businesses. Uh, and for them to play politics on this issue uh, just tells me how little they care about the city, how little they care about the small business owner, uh, and how much they do care about their own political futures and, and, um, and using the city council as a platform for it. Jessica, I'm assuming you don't think it was a no-brainer. Um, I, I think it's quite disingenuous to say that these individuals don't care about their city. In fact, their vote very much reflects that they do care about their city and their constituents. There's a reality that you know any sort of short-term economic gain that they'll get from the RNC will be tarnished by the brand that they will have after the RNC leaves. So I think it's important that you know both sides were heard and as a Wake County Commission, I'm very happy that we did not have to make this decision of all of our problems. We're glad that this isn't one because there's a reality that along with the RNC will come a lot of divisiveness, um, a heavy police presence, um, probably a, a militarized city. So I think those individuals, you know, Braxton and Dimple were being very cognizant and listening to the concerns of a city that is primarily Democrat. Do you think if it was anybody but Donald Trump, it would have been different? I do think it would have been different. This isn't just a conversation about the RNC or the DNC. Um, Donald Trump is a particular brand of politics that has been dangerous, has been dangerous to immigrant families. He's ordered the tearing of families apart. He has said things that are just outright racist and discriminatory in a country that has once prided itself on being a melting pot. So more so than this being an issue of the RNC coming to North Carolina, their votes in particular were a stand against the controversial and outright mean-spiritedness of the Trump administration's policies. Alfredo, uh, to, the vote aside, based on what we saw yesterday in the world's reaction, is it not fair to at least discuss or have an issue potentially with President Trump in the city of Charlotte, particularly if you're a Democrat? Well, but let's, let's, let's be very clear. The increased uh, police presence is gonna be the result of very few bad apples organized by progressive liberal groups uh, to, to wreak havoc on the city. That's why we're gonna need a, uh, an increase in police uh, presence. It's not because you, you have folks coming here to nominate um, you know, their president uh, for a second term. Uh, you know, the, the, the chaos and the increased police presence is gonna be all, all due to the, the organized efforts of progressive liberal groups looking to wreak havoc on the city. And hopefully uh, what doesn't happen is that they don't go ahead and, um, you know, ruin uh, local businesses by, you know, throwing trash cans through their windows or by setting cars on fire. Um, you know, that's, that's the disingenuous part about this is that, you know, they want to use this as an opportunity to continue to tarnish the Republican Party, to continue to tarnish our president. Um, and the way they do it is destructive.
I think our president does a great job of tarnishing his own brand. Well, and we should say that the police presence would likely be the same regardless of who was the president, uh, because that happened in 2012 as well, uh, because of the, what is required by the federal government for that. Stick tight. we got to take a short break. When we return, we'll have more of their insiders, a lot to talk about. First, our question of the day. On this day in 1967, legendary jazz musician and North Carolina native John Coltrane died. In what town was he born? Was it Hamlet, High Point, or Henderson? Answer when we return. Welcome back. Time for the answer to that question of the day. In what North Carolina town was legendary jazz musician John Coltrane, Coltrane from? Coltrane, excuse me. The answer is Hamlet. His family moved to High Point along, not long after he was born. He studied saxophone in Philadelphia, collaborated with other jazz greats like Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis. He recorded 50 albums before he died on this day back in 1967. All right, let's get back to politics now. Our insiders for the hot political topics of the day. Joining us tonight, Republican consultant Alfredo Rodriguez and Jessica Holmes, a Democrat and chairwoman of the Wake County Commission. Uh, welcome back to both of you. All right, so we're going to have six constitutional amendments on the ballot this fall. Uh, there have been some murmurs in Democratic circles that there might be a push to try to get people to make it easier, vote them all down. Uh, I'm sure uh, Republicans will say vote them all up. Uh, Jessica, you are the Democrat. Do you think that's a smart strategy? Well, I think voters have every reason to be distrustful and cautious of this particular General Assembly. When you look at the names of each of the constitutional amendments, they all sound really nice. For example, one related to the rights of victims of crime and things like making sure that we cap our income tax. But everything that comes out of this General Assembly, you know, even if well-intentioned, has turned out to have an adverse impact. And I'll use the well-intentioned class size restrictions as an example of something that was well-intentioned but turned into complete class size chaos because it didn't keep in mind that urban counties simply don't have the space to you know, add all of these classrooms in time to meet their restrictions. I mean, this is a general assembly that you know, a court said targeted African Americans with surgical precision when it comes to voting. So no, I don't want this General Assembly to have anything to do with my rights and when it comes to filling the vacancies of judges. Most of what you've seen out of this General Assembly has amounted to a power grab. And these constitutional amendments are essentially an effort to get out the vote and to wound up their base. But I don't think that these constitutional amendments truly have the hearts and minds and the best interests of North Carolinians at heart. All right, Alfredo, you are the consultant in-house today. Is it smart on the Democrats' part, though, to just sort, sort of say, let's vote them all down, and that way it doesn't matter which one individually, but vote them all down at once? Well, you know, I think it's cute that they have uh, created this November movement. Um, and, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, it's quite fitting. Uh, you know, the Democratic Party here in, in North Carolina is the party that consistently votes no for, you know, all of the, um, all of the benefits and, and blessings that the state of North Carolina has received. Uh, you know, the, one of the best economies uh, in the country, uh, you know, one of the uh, best job creating states in the country. Um, and, and, you know, what's disingenuous is to say that these, these amendments are, are an attack on our citizens. Uh, you know, there, there are amendments to protect the integrity of our, uh, of our voting system. Uh, there are amendments to go ahead and protect the victims of crime. Uh, and there are, there are amendments to, you know, protect the, the taxpayer from, uh, you know, uh, an, an assembly uh, or a governor uh, that wishes to raise taxes simply to, uh, to have more money in their coffers to, um, to spend. Uh, so the, you know, the, these are amendments that protect our citizens. Uh, they're good. They're going to continue the good policies uh, and the, uh, the good direction that this state is going. Well, the one good thing is uh, they can either vote yes or no. And so if they do yes or no, it makes it easy, I guess, for the, uh, the voters to depend on which one. Uh, we talked so much in the first segment. We're unfortunately out of time. But good to see you both. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Plenty to talk about. Time for one last break. When we return the ballot, we'll have some third-party candidates on it come November. But will we see any third-party candidates in office? We'll ask the leaders of the state's third parties about that and their impact on Republicans and Democrats after this break.